fishing. So, how did everyone like that arm sponsored coffee break? They, they didn't actually ask me to say their name that much. So if, if you, uh, the gentleman who is here from ARM, this is a bonus. Um, so our next speaker is Dusty Mabe, and he is going to be talking to us about Atomic. Right? Right. You want this one or you want that one? I want this one. Oh, sweet. And I'm going to stand over here to the side so I can actually see. I actually need to switch this. Can't do anything with my left hand. Um, okay, so my name is Dusty Mabe. Uh, I'm representing the Atomic Working Group, which has meant a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, Langdon just asked me to clarify. Uh, I am not currently representing the Cloud Working Group up here right now. The Cloud Working Group uh, is the one that delivers the cloud base image, which is essentially uh, the classic um, log into your system and install RPMs. Uh, or use cloud in it to kind of boot it up. He wanted me to clarify a lot of other things, but I don't uh, necessarily build that into this talk. So, <laughs> um, um, so I'm representing the Atomic Working Group. Uh, what is the Atomic Working Group? Uh, we've kind of been three different parts up until this point. Obviously, there's the Atomic Host part. Um, there's also the container runtimes part, so uh, we have a team of people that work on um, you know, Docker or Podman or other container runtimes, so how do you run containers on your host. Um, and we also have a group uh, that works on essentially application containers within Fedora, so helping take applications that are traditionally delivered by RPMs in Fedora and packaging them up in containers and putting them in a registry that Fedora users th can then download and use. Uh, so let me start with the containers team's updates. Um, so first of all, uh, we've had a lot of work done here in the containers teams, and now each of our tools has its own little avatar. Um, so Mo Duffy created a, a container, um, container runtimes coloring book, book I believe, and essentially what we have is a different avatar for each tool. We've got Podman, Scopio, we've got Builda, we've got Cryo, and a little guy over there for OpenShift uh, Origin, uh, which is pretty awesome, I think. So I decided to include that in this uh, portion of the talk. Uh, but, you know, really what has happened with the containers teams in the past six months, I asked Dan Walsh to give me kind of a condensed version and he gave me two pages of notes. Um, so like that's what we ended up with. Uh, I essentially took that and tried to condense it down into something that was consumable for this audience. Um, so first off, we'll start with a tool called Cryo. Uh, Cryo is essentially a container runtime for Kubernetes. It's versioned with Kubernetes and released with Kubernetes. So for example, if you want to run Kubernetes 1.11, you would choose Cryo 1.11 and not another version, uh, which is really nice because you know that it was tested with Kubernetes 1.11 and it's more likely to work and you don't have to deal with version mismatches and all that, um, which can be quite troublesome as we found out when trying to pair it with something like Docker. Um, so it's version with Kubernetes, release with Kubernetes. We also have OpenShift Origin that is trying to target Cryo and only target Cryo at this point. Um, so using Cryo as a runtime. Uh, we're currently running OpenShift Online, which is essentially a place where you can go try out OpenShift if you wanna um, you know, just kick the tires with it and see if it's something that you could use. Um, so it actually runs on top of Cryo now. And we also have that running in uh, Microsoft Azure for Kata containers. So Cryo is running in the wild, which is kind of cool. Um, so other things that they've done in Cryo in the past six months is offer a better security through, they added a rootless mode. Um, they've added no dev mount. So you know if you had a file system that was mounted with device nodes on it, the kernel will ignore that now. And they've added some uh, ability to control capabilities a little better for uh, cryo containers. Um, the next tool is Podman, which is essentially a way to run local containers on your system via CLI or API. It's essentially a Docker equivalent. Um, they, uh, you know, one thing that we've done there is added the ability to actually d build OCI images with Podman. So previously, Podman build was not a thing, uh, but they've actually coordinated with Builda 
and now you can run podman build just as if you uh, had done docker build and it will actually create an OCI container on your local system that you can then pull, push or pull uh, from a registry which is quite nice. Um, they also added a rootless mode so if you've ever had an issue where you wanted to run docker on a system but you didn't want to run it as root you can now do that with something called podman which is pretty awesome. They also did some work with uh, rootless network namespaces um, which is actually something that's uh, been pretty hard to do in the past. They use a technology called slurp for net namespace. Um, and they added user namespace report or support and a remote API via varlink. This has enabled them to create essentially Python bindings or integrate with tools like cockpit. Um, Builda is essentially a tool that you can use to build OCI container images. It's the backend for Podman build. Um, they also have added layer caching now. So previously, if you ran Docker build, you would get caching for every layer if, uh, for example, you know, part of your Docker file had not changed. You now get that with Builda and with Podman build. Um, and they added rootless container builds. So if you're an unprivileged user on a system, you can actually just inside your home directory create an OCI container image, uh, which is like, you know, a, I guess more or less a uh, sophisticated version of a tarball, which you theoretically should not need root for. So they added it so you can do rootless container builds, support for user namespaces again, and integration into OpenShift. So if you uh, did any builds in OpenShift in the past, you were running on top of Docker build essentially. Um, now they have that integrated into OpenShift a little better, so now you're using Builda instead of Docker build. Um, all right, condensing this down into a few uh, other things, Scopio, container storage and containers image, which are libraries that Scopio uses. Um, these are essentially used to push and pull container images from registries. Uh, they added, uh, you know, rootless support, layer support, better security, compression, etc. Another thing to note is a lot of upstream projects are now starting to use these tools like uh, these libraries and Scopio itself. OpenSUSE has to be, happens to be one that we're collaborating with a lot there. So this kind of shows you a little bit of the health of the project. You know, having different upstream communities uh, work on these tools and use them is a really good thing. Okay, so application containers. So we have a thing called registry.fedoraproject.org, which is where you can go grab some uh, different uh, applications, you know, Postgres, or, you know, we've got a whole list of them here, memcached, httpd, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have had this ability for a little while, but it's kind of been more of a, you know, come to the working group and try to figure out how to build it in a candidate registry and then figure out how, who to talk to in order to get it released. Um, so Clement's been working on uh, actually making this like an official thing within Fedora so you can get container updates in Bodhi. You don't have to like talk to some person in release engineering that you might not necessarily know at the moment to try to figure out how to get it released because the current version that's released has a bug in it, etc. So he's been doing a lot of good work there. He's also been working on building flat packs using our tool that builds these container images called OSBS. Um, so uh, I think it was mentioned earlier that we want to deliver flat packs in Fedora. Um, and so he's been working with Owen, I think they're on making that happen. Both of those are in staging right now, so they should hit pretty soon. Um, and the other thing that's been working on is multi-arch container building in OSBS. So actually building those applications for other architectures, not just 64-bit uh, AMD Intel. Okay, so he actually sent out a, I don't know, call for something, uh, call for interest um, recently on the develop mailing list and I actually got a lot of interest in people wanting to join the special interest group for uh, containers. So uh, there is a session later this week on uh, Friday, I think, is that August 10th, whatever August 10th is, I think that's Friday, uh, from 1.20 to 3.10 p.m. Uh, later, I also advertise another session and I use 24 hour format time, so <laughs> I'm keeping everybody on their toes. Um, and it is Mycin and Ratable, I don't know how to say that, but that is where that will be. So if you're interested, you should definitely join that session so that we can actually get more application containers within Fedora and help uh, knock down some of the barriers there that people are having. That room is this room. Okay, here. Um, all right, Atomic Host. 
So around the Fedora 28 time frame for Atomic Host, um, the Atomic Host community has been really growing and we've had a lot more engagement in the community for people uh, that are interested in the technology and interesting, interested in using it and interested in the unique features that it has. Um, one other thing to say is the, the RPM OS tree technology itself has really been catching on. So for example, we actually have two other additions that are now using RPM OS tree underneath. Uh, that's Fedora IoT, which I think Peter will talk about. And then Fedora Silverblue, which Matthias talked about earlier. Um, so both of those are using RPM OS tree underneath. Uh, just delivering a different package set and packaging it up a little different way and delivering updates um, on their own cadence. Um, also in the Fedora 28 timeframe for Atomic Host, we started shipping Podman by default. Podman's pretty new. It's made a lot of progress over the past six months. Um, and, you know, definitely try that out if you haven't yet. Uh, also, automated updates. Um, so this is something that we did not have for a long time and uh, Jonathan Lebon from the Atomic team started working on that and now, for example, your system can check for automatic update or check, check for updates automatically without you having to type RPM OS tree upgrade or some, you know, otherwise script that via Ansible or, or some other way. We also have a unified server side OS tree repository, which means, you know, when you are pulling content from Fedora, you only need to look in one place. Uh, previously, we had a different repository for every release of Fedora, so Fedora 25 and 24 had their own um, repositories. Now it's all in the same place, all the different architectures are in the same place, and then also Atomic Workstation slash Silverblue and Atomic Host are in the same place, which means that if they share any common files, which is likely, um, they'll also be deduped. We don't need to store that many, many times. Um, Multi-Arch, basically we have uh, ARCH64 and PowerPC64 Little Indian um, architectures with Atomic Host. We've been releasing those at the same time that we released the 64-bit AMD um, x86-64 uh, OS tree. So those get, uh, you know, released at the same time and have some level of testing, not quite as much as the 64-bit Intel, but um, we've been proud to actually offer that as well. Uh, and those get shipped every two weeks, and I'd like to thank everybody who helps enable that um, because we've automated a lot of stuff, but it also still takes, um, you know, some manual work. So I'd like to appreciate uh, everybody who helps us find, find issues, report issues, and fix problems as they come out. So what is the future of Atomic Host is the big question here, and I'll take a side detour, which is to say, Matt mentioned it earlier, but uh, Red Hat acquired CoreOS earlier this year. I actually saw this exact tweet when I got home from DevConf, uh, you know, right about the same time that I got home from DevConf. And this is actually really great because uh, the CoreOS um, uh, team, the CoreOS company, basically has or had, I don't know which term you necessarily want to use, uh, like really excellent engineers, a really great open source philosophy, a focus on security, um, and also a vast community and user base. They really aligned well with uh, a lot of the things that we believe in Fedora and we believe at Red Hat. Um, so I was really happy to, to see that uh, they had agreed to join Red Hat and to join our community. So one thing that I'd like to say is if you meet any of them here um, or you know, virtually to welcome them into the Fedora community and to make them feel like uh, this is a great place to be uh, because it really is and we're really excited to have them with us. Um, okay, so I'm going back to Atomic Host now. So in the Fedora 29 timeframe, <coughs> Atomic Host will continue on for Fedora 29. Um, we'll have regular releases until Fedora 30 comes out and at that point basically we'd like to move on to Fedora Core OS which is the new thing that we're going to have. Um, so the reason for not having a lot of new um, features or work in Fedora 29 is because we're figuring out what Fedora Core OS will look like exactly and trying to build the community there. So Fedora Core OS. Um, so the goal here is basically to merge the container Linux and atomic host communities into one and also, uh, you know, kind of take an opportunity to 
um, revisit the design goals for each operating system you know when they were originally designed and see if there's things that we want to change or improve upon um, so that's essentially what we've been doing and what we will be doing for a short time period um, for the next you know four to five months or so um, and then the goal is that we basically release Fedora Core OS officially for Fedora 30 um, so that's why we'll have a Fedora 29 atomic host um, and I'd really like to ask people to get involved. We have a forum mailing list IRC channel, Issue Tracker weekly meeting. Um, so we basically got the, the framework for a good community there. We've had a decent level of engagement already so far. Um, and I have a link up there to our Issue Tracker, which is where you can essentially click through to find the mailing list or forum or IRC channel and all that. Um, it's hash fedora-coreos on Freenode. Um, and we also have a talk tomorrow, me, Benjamin Gilbert, and myself. Benjamin is from the uh, Container Linux team. He does a good job representing uh, all of their interests. Um, we have that talk tomorrow at 2.30 to 3.20, 14.30 to 15.20 in Hamburg. So come visit us. Who's next? <laughs>